You were just a turd out there. Welcome back to Banging the Can, the Houston sports show that does not apologize for championship rings and tings presented by Bolin Media. I am Ross Bolin, and damn it, damn it, son of a bitch, goddamn Lamar Jackson, fucking Baltimore, The Wire, Stavros and Ronnie, fuck it all. I apologize. I'm still in the anger phase of grieving. So let's take care of all the negativity up front, and then we can attempt to move on together and look to the future. Look, it always sucks when one of your favorite teams' season comes to an end, especially when your team is actually worth watching again after a long stretch of the opposite. There's no way around it. It stinks, okay? There's a sort of depression that sets in when you wake up that next day, like I did yesterday on Sunday, and you realize... There is no more Texans football. That was it. It's done. So let's talk about what happened. The Ravens beat the shit out of the Texans in Baltimore, 34 to 10. And this is exactly why I was trying to avoid buying in too much to this team. This is year one of a new era, first time head coach, rookie quarterback. We needed to be realistic about our expectations, but we fucked around and found out. And that's honestly, like CJ Stroud was so hot that we were ready to be hurt again way before we should have been ready to be hurt again. And now we've been hurt and we feel stupid. And that's just part of sports. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. And we really had him in the first half. I'm not going to lie. And by that, I mean the Ravens played like ass in the first half and let us hang around despite failing to score an offensive touchdown. And then in the second half, 24 unanswered points. This was basically the reverse of Super Wild Card Weekend, Texans versus Browns, and we were the Browns this time. It was our turn to shit the bed, and now we're all covered in poo. Now, we know what the next level looks like after this game. That's the next level, and we aren't there yet. We are one level below true contenders. And honestly, if you told us that before the season started, we would all take it. We would, every single one of you watching and listening, would have taken this season and that loss against Baltimore on the road in a heartbeat. No questions asked. Every single one of us would have agreed to it, but that doesn't really make it hurt or suck any less right now. But this is still huge. To be right there, one level below actual championship contending football teams, but it's also where we've been before. Like, this is the highest level of football this franchise has ever achieved. It's the same level we were at with the best Texans teams of all time back in the Arian Foster, Andre Johnson, J.J. Watt days. But the difference is that this time, with a real bona fide superstar franchise quarterback, we should actually be able to reach the true contender level in the next year or two. And I think that's giving it a realistic window. Like, next year we should be better. We all hope we will be. But definitely by the year after that, within two seasons, like, the expectation has been set now. And that's one thing D'Amico Ryans and C.J. Stroud are going to have to cope with in year two. After this season, getting 10 regular season wins, getting two the divisional round of the playoffs against what it, I think to me, the Ravens are the best team in the NFL this year and then getting mopped, getting, getting taught a lesson, getting sat back down. Like the expectation is you improve from here and you get to where the Ravens are at. And we're not that far from it. As much of it may have seemed like it on Saturday afternoon, watching us just kind of get dominated. Like we're right there. We're right there. And I think all of us can see that and make peace with it. And that's, that's, That's huge. That's huge. But this game against the Ravens was way too similar to a couple of those playoff games against the Patriots or the Chiefs several years back where there was just this energy in the stadium with the fans and on the field with the players like they all knew we didn't belong there, that they didn't take us seriously and they didn't feel threatened by us at all. And I think that similar feeling triggered a lot of us. Because we felt it too many times as Texans fans that even when we had a really good regular season team, when we got to the playoffs and we played a real contender, they knew and all of their fans knew that we weren't it. And that's 
that sucks. That stunk. It was tough. It made it really hard. I fucking hate that feeling. It's so demoralizing and defeating, and you can kind of see when your guys aren't rising up above that feeling or that energy, and you're just kind of doomed from the start. And that's how Saturday felt for the most part. Like, first couple possessions, you you could tell, like, we weren't really ready for this. They Baltimore was a little bit faster and a little bit stronger and a little bit more on top of the ball and had a little more energy than we did in every facet of the game. And that makes it hard to win on the road in the playoffs when you're, you got a trip to the AFC Championship on the line. Like, the punt return for a touchdown that Sims had, in the end, it was, it was really a red herring. It kept us all locked in through halftime, but, like, deep in my heart, I knew. Like, I knew we were fucked. Fun as it was, the punt return, nice as it was to be tied at the half, I knew we were fucked. You know how I knew we were fucked? Because we couldn't even get a snap count right. Before the Ravens even had to really do anything, we were shooting ourselves in the foot, punching ourselves in the balls, kicking our own asses with pre-snap penalties. The Texans committed 11 penalties on Saturday, a franchise playoff record. We would have preferred to avoid that one. Six penalties in the first quarter alone, the most first quarter penalties for any team in a playoff game in the NFL since at least the year 2000. Why at least the year 2000? I don't really know. Maybe that's when they started tracking this, but the year 2000 was 24 fucking years ago. That's a lot of penalties. The most first quarter penalties for any team in a playoff game since at least 2000. That is still blowing my mind. Eight of 11 penalties for the Texans came on the offensive side of the ball. Here is every penalty, just for funsies, that the Texans committed because I'm a masochist. False start, intentional grounding, false start, defensive holding, false start, delay of game, encroachment, false start, neutral zone infraction, offensive holding, false start, fucking brutal. Discipline is, without a doubt, the number one place we have to improve for next season. Like, without that, without discipline, Without the ability to avoid self-inflicted wounds, you cannot and will not win a championship in the NFL. It is not going to happen. You've never seen a sloppy football team advance, probably, I guess, probably gotten to the AFC or NFC championship, but like advance to the Super Bowl. It's not going to fucking happen. You have to have your shit together, your P's and Q's, your T's crossed, your I's dotted, and we did not have even close to that on Saturday. Lamar Jackson, fucking running around all game, barely had to throw the ball. I mean, it was so frustrating. He had 11 rushing attempts for 100 yards, averaging 9.1 yards per carry. I don't know enough about defensive scheming to understand why more often we didn't have a guy in spy like tracking Lamar. It seems like when you play against, there's a handful of quarterbacks in the NFL that you know they can fucking run. And Lamar Jackson is the best out of all of them. Another one as an example is Josh Allen. But like Lamar, you when you when you are playing the Ravens, you have to know this dude has the ability to scramble and break you off for like 25 yards. If you don't have your shit covered, and we, if it felt like we just let him have that all game long, like our, our strategy was to make sure the receivers were covered up, but kind of let Lamar do his thing. Like, you know how in basketball, sometimes they'll be like, oh, fuck it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll guard the hell out of Steph Curry and we'll make them beat us another way. Or as for a more recent, um, like comparison, we'll guard Jokic and we'll make them beat us with Murray. Like that's how it feels like we handled Lamar Jackson. We we're like, oh, We'll cover the receivers and we'll make them beat us with Lamar Jackson. And guess what? They beat us with Lamar Jackson. They beat us handily with Lamar Jackson. That did not work is what I'm saying. He was just able to do whatever the fuck he wanted on foot. And it was the Lamar Jackson show. Nobody else on the Ravens offense even had to get out of bed. I think their biggest receiver had like 40 yards or something. Like this was just the Lamar Jackson show. We blitzed all fucking day. He protected the football, even though he was sacked three times, even though we were blitzing almost every play. Like, D'Amico Ryans, as the commentators repeatedly referenced, got way out of his comfort zone here, was blitzing a lot more than we did during the regular season. I think that was his effort to keep Lamar um, in the pocket and under control, and it didn't fucking work. It just did not work. Maybe we don't have good enough defensive personnel yet. Maybe that scheme in general wasn't the one we should have gone with for the Ravens and Lamar. Regardless, it doesn't really matter. It didn't fucking work, and we lost as a result because where we couldn't really get anything going offensively because their defense was all over us, it's not even that Lamar had that much time. He just was 
able to work with it. Like when the pocket collapsed, he said, okay, peace and fucking took off downfield and there was nobody there to cover him. And it was tough to watch. Now, CJ Stroud was running as well, but not downfield. He was running for his life all game. The offensive line got punked badly, badly. And the rushing game for the Texans was once again non-existent. And as good as the offensive line was this year for what they are, I think they, uh, they, they outperformed a lot of people's, including mine, expectations for this season. Kept CJ healthy and safe for the most part, minus that concussion. They can't run block for shit. This was embarrassing. Like, Singletary couldn't get anything going. Lamar Jackson way outrushed the Texans. Singletary had nine rushes for 22 yards, okay? If your running back has nine rushes for 22 yards, period, you're probably fucked. But if he has nine rushes for 22 yards and their quarterback has 11 rushes for 100 yards, you lose, Mr. Lebowski. The bums will always lose. You cannot win a football game that way. And that was pretty much the tale of the tape on Saturday. And I know we're all hurting. We're all hurting, and we didn't expect to have to feel this way again this year. And nobody wants to hear this shit after a loss. But the truth is, we are exceedingly blessed. We are lucky. We are very, very lucky. And I will tell you why after this quick message from today's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Factor. And if you're like me, then you're either too busy, too tired, or too ineffective in the kitchen to worry about what's for dinner when you're just trying to relax at the end of the day and enjoy the sports ball on TV. That's where Factor comes in and takes care of everything. I just go to the fridge, pick out a Factor, toss it in the microwave for two minutes. Bang, I'm eating like a king on the couch watching sports. It's cheaper, better, and better for you than takeout. Get started on your resolutions for Factor so you're ready all 2024. Four factors ready to eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, plus veggie, and more. Plus, over 55 weekly add ons. You will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They're ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Forget frantic lunch preps and rushed dinners. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals all delivered right to your door. I've got two young kids at home. I can't cook for shit. I survived off Factor in 2023, and I've been doing it again in 2024. You can do the same. Head to factormeals.com slash BTC50 and use code BTC50 to get 50% off. That's code BTC50 at factormeals.com slash BTC50 to get 50% off. F-A-C-T-O-R meals.com slash BTC50. Now, we all need something positive to get us through this morning Monday, and the truth is... There is a lot of positivity to hang your hat on. So listen up and listen well. We won three games last season. Three. We won four games each of the two seasons prior. So with our playoff win this year, we won 11 games. That is more than we won the previous three seasons combined. So if you're still sitting there moping, feeling sorry for yourself, woe is me, the Texans still suck, oh no, we suck again, just stop it. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Is there a little bit of pain and a letdown and a small dip and some sports depression here to deal with? Of course. But if you're down on the franchise as a whole or the team as a whole, you're doing yourself a disservice as a fan. It's not necessary. It's not needed. We won more fucking football games this year than we have in the past three years put together. This was a massive leap in the right direction. Not even a step or four. It was a fucking jump. We jumped years into the future from where we should have been. And as a, like largely because of the 2023 NFL draft. Nick Casario, just to give him even more credit here. Again, we picked up CJ Stroud, Will Anderson Jr., and Tank Dell. CJ Stroud, the number two pick. Will Anderson Jr., the number three pick. Tank Dell in the third round at 69th overall is nice. That was huge. That's three guys that we can build a franchise around. We've got Stingley Jr. at quarterback from a couple years prior, or at cornerback, excuse me, from a couple years prior. We have the pieces in place to build a championship team. I can't remember the last time we were able to say that. On both sides of the ball, we've got core guys to build around. All right, so let Nick Casario and D'Amico Ryans cook. 
It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be hurting because of the way things went on Saturday. But you cannot be down on the franchise or the team right now. That doesn't make any sense. This is so much better than we could have even imagined for year one of the new era. Just take away fucking everything regarding the playoffs. The way C.J. Stroud performed in the regular season should be more than enough for any sane Texans fan to hang their hat on in 2023-2024. We got what we came for. We got our quarterback. We got our head coach in D'Amico Ryans. All right? We're in a great, great place. That being said, I saw Adam Schefter tweeted, here are Texans' key free agents this offseason. He went on to list every single free agent that we have, which includes tight end Dalton Schultz, defensive end Jonathan Greenard, uh, Grenard, running back Devin Singletary, defensive tackle Sheldon Rankins, cornerback Steven Nelson, wide receiver Noah Brown, linebacker Blake Cashman, offensive tackle George Fant, Jerry Hughes, Michael Dieter, Denzel Perryman, Kareem Jackson, DeAndre Houston Carson, Adrian Amos, Khalil Davis, Derek Barnett, Tavier Thomas, Josh Jones, Tier Tart, Cameron Johnston, Kaimi Fairbairn, Dare Agunbowale, Eric Murray, Charlie Heck, John Weeks, a lot of guys. And you know what? A lot of those guys are going out the door. I think we will bring a few of these dudes back, but for the most part, like, some of the guys that I thought, I mean, before the last two weeks, I would have thought for sure were coming back, like Dalton Schultz. I don't think you re-signed Schultz. I think you let him go. I think there's only a few guys on this list that you really look at. Like Blake Cashman, I would like to see him get another shot. Denzel Perryman, maybe. Those are going to be D'Amico Ryan's defensive-minded decisions that I am not even going to try to argue with whatever he does. But you're going to see a lot of new blood next season is my point. All right? We've got the key pieces in place. Now, you let D'Amico Ryans and Nick Casario cook. We have a shit fucking ton of cap space. There are some very intriguing wide receivers hitting the free agent market, like Mike Evans, who might want to come home. All right? You get one or two more good to great wide receivers to work with Nico Collins and Tank Dell. You're in arguable one-two, depending on which one is one and which one is two. We'll see next year, but like... You've got two good receivers. you got a great quarterback. You add a couple more receivers into the mix, maybe bolster the offensive line a little bit as well because God knows we could use the run blocking. I don't even know if you need to go find another running back. Like, I think Singletary can get it done, but if they don't want Singletary, if they want to go another route, I would understand that too because, frankly, the way the NFL is nowadays, it's more about the run blocking than it is the actual individual running back skill set for the most part. So we're in a great place is what I'm trying to say. And I think there's just a little bit of retooling and restructuring to be done here. Make sure that D'Amico and Nick are able to get their personnel in the building, right? Reshuffle the deck a little bit. Let some guys go that didn't necessarily step up to the challenge. Bring some other guys in that are hungry. You want the culture fit to be... That's a very important piece of what they're building here. And what any championship NFL team builds. Culture, right? What did people say about the Patriots during their dynasty? It was the Patriot way. Bill Belichick had a very specific way of doing things that translated and permeated throughout the entire organization and resulted in many, many championships. That's what you have to do. If you want sustained, long-term success in the NFL, which God knows we would even uh, be okay with short-term success in the NFL, but you got to let these guys build. You can't just be out because it was a disappointing ending. And I mean, even me, I talked to myself, like I was like, we could fucking beat the Ravens. We could fucking do this. We can fucking do it. CJ's a freak. We can fucking do it. But the truth is, they game planned for him so, like, he didn't really have a chance. You didn't even, this was one of maybe two or three games this whole year that I saw CJ Stroud get taken down a peg or two. Like, he didn't have time. Guys were not open. And he wasn't getting downfield on foot. So it was kind of just, we had no offense. We had no running game. We had no offense. They covered up Nico Collins, and we were screwed. Dalton Schultz has hands made of stone. They, I mean, he made a good catch a little later in the game, but like they, it was all around a sad offensive performance. Defensively, it could have been better, but offensively, we never had a chance. We were never. We didn't score an offensive fucking touchdown. We got a field goal and a defensive touch or a special teams touchdown on a punt return. That's our ten points right there. That's it. So. We're going to have to get better. We're going to have to get better. And there are a lot of guys that are becoming free agents that are going to be gone. And I'm I'm just really, really curious to see what the Texans do during the offseason. This will probably be the most exciting offseason 
and I mean this, in the history of the Houston Texans. Like, will we have a chance to make that jump from one level below NFL, like real Super Bowl contender, to legit, legit contender? It can be done this offseason if they play their cards right. So really looking forward to watching that unfold. The other thing is like C.J. Stroud, that was his first year, right? First year rookie quarterback, record-setting, historic rookie quarterback season. What, where does he improve? Well, this weekend, watching these other divisional round games play out, watching Lamar Jackson run all the fuck over us, watching Josh Allen and Mahomes play, C.J. Stroud is maybe going to need to be more willing to scramble and get out of the pocket and run with the football. That was not something that he felt comfortable doing much this season. Not really sure why, if it was more about protecting him or if that's like not, you know, his forte or whatever, but he's going to have to get out and run. There's just been too many, like, countless plays this year where I was like, oh my God, there's nobody on him and he's scrambling and, well, he threw it. It was like he had 10 yards to take easy and he didn't take it. He threw instead. I don't know, like, strategy-wise, what they're communicating to him, what Bobby Sloak and D'Amico Ryans have been telling him about scrambling. Maybe they're trying to keep him healthy all season, like I said, avoid injury, whatever. But watching the best quarterbacks in the league play this weekend, it became very apparent to me CJ's going to need to grow in that arena. As far as, like, his long ball, his check downs, his ability to see the field, his pocket presence, like, all those things are good. I'm not sure you can pick a whole lot of places he needs to improve. But if you had to pick one, it's running the football. It's running the football and being willing to run the football and knowing when to run the football versus just, you know, throw it away or, or, or force a throw downfield. So I'd say that's pretty much it in terms of how C.J. Stroud can improve, which, again, is the reason that I'm as optimistic as I am. The kid is really, really good. He's 22 years old. He's got a ton of room for growth. And I genuinely believe that the combo of him and D'Amico Ryans can lead us to a Super Bowl one day. I genuinely believe that. Not just homering. I'm not, not just being a Texans fanboy. I'm saying, for real, for real, he looks to have all that it takes to win in this league. And D'Amico Ryans, one season in, seems like one of the best coaches in football. And that's exciting stuff. How can the Texans improve as a team? We said number one already, discipline. The fuck, like, Tunsil's one of our best offensive linemen, but that motherfucker can't count. Like, how, how you lose the snap count that many times in a season is astounding to me. And he's great. I love Tunsil. But, like, this translated, I feel like when you've got a leader like that, like Tunsil, leader of the def- uh, offensive line, and he starts making that mistake over and over, that shit trickles down, man. And then all of a sudden you got all these dudes fucking standing up before they're supposed to. Discipline is going to be the number one thing. Number one thing, got to have more discipline next season. Offensive line could also be better at blocking, run blocking in particular. Like, they've got to be able to create holes for running backs. We've got to be able to have a running game to balance our offense out so it's not just reliant on CJ's arm. As we know, if you know football, you know that if you can establish a running game, it gives your quarterback more time in the pocket. Guys aren't able to jump routes the same way. Defense has to change their coverage up. It's not as easy to predict what you're going to do if you've got a dynamic offense that can both run and throw. So that's going to be a big thing for us next year, too. Run blocking in particular, but offensive line blocking on the whole. Offensive line has got to get better. The more time we can give CJ, the more points we're going to score every game. That's just the way it's going to go. Um, Offensive play calling in the red zone in particular was not good this season. Not good. Inconsistent, got too cute way too many times, and if you have to say something about Bobby Sloak that's bad, it's this. He did it again this game against the Ravens. Fucking double reverse flea flicker shit for negative five yards. It just, like, it wasn't the time or the place. It wasn't the time or the place to try to pull some shit like that off. And, yes, people were pointing out on Twitter, like, oh, we were one block away from that being a huge chunk play. It That's... What the fuck? You could say that about like half the plays in the game. It's not, it didn't happen. The block didn't happen. It wasn't a chunk play. It was a five yard loss on a fucking sneaky, cute trick play that never should have happened. We got too cute too often. And in particular, in the red zone, Slowick didn't seem to really have a, like, a style he was going to stick to. He just, it just, it wasn't good enough. Wasn't good enough. Gotta have better play calling in the red zone. And then our defensive backs gave up too many big plays this year. Like, Stingley was phenomenal. But outside of him, 
there was a lot of maybes and what ifs. I, I, it, we need more there. We need more talent. We need more guys who can cover man, who can cover one on one, and who can like just fly to the football a little more. So we'll see what happens. But those are the areas that, for me, again, not a professional, just a fan watching every game, paying close attention. Some obvious areas for improvement that can take us to that next level we are talking about. Now, another big thing this offseason will be what happens with offensive coordinator Bobby Slowick. He's 36 years old. He's my age, which was somehow depressing. Um, He's interviewed with the Titans, the Panthers, the Seahawks, the Commanders, and the Falcons for a head coaching gig. He's going to take one of them. My guess is he's gone. Who they bring in to replace him an offensive coordinator will say a lot about what we do next year. You have to imagine that C.J. Stroud is going to have some say in that conversation, as will D'Amico Ryans, because I think the way they're handling this between D'Amico and Nick Casario and C.J. Stroud is kind of a partnership. Yeah, Everybody needs to be able to feel like they had a say and that they have a, a say in the direction of the franchise. And in the case of your offensive play caller, you sure as shit want your second-year quarterback to be okay with whoever that person is. Preferably be much better than okay with it. You want him to be stoked. So we'll see what happens there, too. But Bobby Slowick, my guess, gone. At 36 years old, with the kind of momentum he has in the league right now, when you're getting interviewed by five different teams for head coaching vacancies, you don't turn that down. One of them is going to make him an offer. And I think he's going to take it. So I think we can say bye-bye to Bobby. Which, interestingly enough, regardless of how successful the season was for C.J. Stroud, there is a large... Uh, segment of Texans fans who don't like Bobby Slowick. And I find myself mingling with them often this season because, again, the cutesy shit in the red zone pissed me off. I thought he got by on a lot of what C.J. Stroud was making happen, Bobby Slowick was getting credit for. I'm not positive about that, but that was my feel for it. I think Slowick is probably a decent play caller. I don't think he's as good as he's getting credit for is what I'm saying. I think C.J., Got him some of that credit he's getting. So the fact that he's leaving, it doesn't exactly bum me out. I'm like, like it sucks because we just got all this momentum and now we're going to lose our OC and have to get another one. But on the other hand, it's like, I'm kind of curious to see what C.J. Stroud will do in year two with somebody else calling the plays when Bobby's out. Like, will he be better? You know? So there's upside there potentially. We don't really know. And that will be interesting to see. Um, but that's it, man. That's it. This look... Just, I'll say it one more time. This season, if you, if somebody handed you the script for this season last year, and said, would you be okay with this? There's no way you would have turned it down. Absolutely no way. To win more games this year than we did in the three years prior. To know that we have our franchise quarterback. To know that we have our head coach and our GM. To have these cornerstone pieces of the franchise. To have cornerstone guys defensively. You've got Will Anderson Jr. on the line. You've got Derek Stingley Jr. in the secondary. Like, you've got the leaders you need. You've got them. To have all of that and win 11 football games and get to the AFC, or the, the divisional game against the Ravens in Baltimore and learn some hard lessons, I think that will make all the names I just said better and more driven and hungrier. And you know you've got good wide receiver options. You know you've got Nico Collins. You've got Tank Dell when he comes back healthy. See what you can do with the draft. I know we don't have that many picks or whatever, but like we have a ton of cap space. we got a lot of agent, uh, free agents walking out the door. So there's a ton of room to improve here. And all in all, Texans fans, you got to feel good about the way this went because we're real again. We're a serious team, something to be looked at and respected by other teams in the league, albeit not the top of the cream of the crop which is that feeling that we had, like the Ravens fans were looking down on us like their little brother, like it was a joke. And that fucking sucked. But I think, I think I feel confident in saying that the best is yet to come from this group. All right? And I know there's, the counter is like, well, you never know what'll happen. Like CJ could get hurt. It's like, yes, of course. Who the fuck? I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Like nobody knows. Life is crazy. But let's pretend that nothing god awful happens. Let's pretend that our quarterback doesn't end up jacking it on masseuses who aren't asking for it. We're in a good place. All right? Surely nothing like that will happen ever again. All right? Let's just focus on the positive, move forward to next year, exciting offseason of Texans football ahead. 
Enjoy the the championship round. Enjoy the Super Bowl. This was a this was as good of a football season as we could have fucking asked for. That's what I'm saying. We got what we needed, and now we move forward. Now we enter the darkest, dreariest part of the year with dog shit weather and only NBA basketball on the tube. And you got to watch the Rockets. And I'll say this: they're pretty fun. It's pretty exciting stuff. They're just. <laughs> They're not doing anything like crazy record wise, but Alperin Shingun looks like an all star. He's got crazy numbers this year. It took it took three seasons, but we finally got somebody to recognize that he should probably be getting the ball every possession. And uh, and you, you gotta like what the new coach is doing. You gotta like what's happening with the Rockets. Ime Udoka, I feel like is that dude. I don't think they're where the Texans are this year. Like in terms of taking a step out of the basement and seeing how far you can get. I think the Texans, like I said, that was a big leap. And they're right below championship contender status. The Rockets are probably a couple levels below that. Like, they're in the middle of the pack. They're going to need to get some guys around Shingun who can also play basketball consistently really, really well. And they're still, they're just still building the team culture. I think my read is that Fred Van Vliet and uh, Dylan Brooks are kind of like gap stops to that next level. Like they're they're good players. Don't get me wrong, but I, you're not winning a championship with this with them as your two best players. That's not a thing that's going to happen. Or your two best veteran players. Let me put it that way. Um, Shingun is clearly your guy you build around. Clearly, very clear cut. There's no fucking question to be made about this. It's, it's Alper and Shingun, and we'll be talking more about Rockets in the coming weeks. Now that the Texans are done, so we've got Rockets basketball to look forward to. Baseball season is not that far off. Before you know it, pitchers and catchers will be reporting, which brings me to my next point. Huge signing made by the Astros this past week. I'm not going to talk about it today. I want this to be focused on the Texans. We're mourning. We're grieving. We're trying to get through the steps uh, so we can all move on with our lives. But Josh Hader, five years, $95 million, a 29-year-old left-hander, making us perhaps the best bullpen in baseball combined with Abreu and Presley. This is enormous. This guy is arguably one of the best closers of his generation. I didn't even know he was out there. I did not see this coming. Jim Crane opened up his pocketbook. Everybody bitched and moaned. Oh, when's he going to make a move? Why aren't we doing what like the Yankees and the Dodgers do? Oh, everybody else is getting better. Why are we just sitting and standing pat? Like, Graven went down, and Jim Crane went and did what he had to do, which is sign another guy that's a difference maker. All right? We're, we're basically at the point now between Abreu and Presley and Hayter where if we get to the seventh inning with a lead, the game is over. Almost all of the time. That's that's huge. Now, if you imagine a scenario, if you will, with me for a moment, where Rafael Montero pitches like he did in 2021, suddenly, baby, you've got a stew going. That's four guys who can come in and shut the fuck down. So, huge move from the Astros, one that I will discuss either next week or later this week, depending on my schedule, but... um. Another thing for us to leave on a positive note. So a great season for the Texans. Astros doing big things. Rockets moving in the right direction. It's a good time to be a Houston sports fan, regardless of the disappointment that came on Saturday. And that will do it for today's show. Remember, every episode of Banging the Can is available on YouTube.com slash at Banging the Can. I appreciate those of you who are already there watching instead of just listening. If you prefer... The podcast platforms, of course, we are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all the major podcast platforms, and we appreciate you as well. But if you would, go subscribe on YouTube.com slash at Banging the Can. Even if you don't care to watch, it just helps the show grow, helps us work our way through the YouTube algorithm and make sure that more people see the show. On that note, share, please, the most unapologetic Houston sports show in existence with your friends and family. Support our sponsors. If you liked riding with me all Texans season long and Astros season before that, Telling people about the show is the way to pay it back. That does so much for us, but of course also supporting our sponsors. Like today we had factormeals.com slash BTC50 with code BTC50 to get 50% off. That's how I'm able to keep the show going. This is my full-time job. I've got Bolin Media, a small startup in Austin, Texas, where uh, we record all these different shows, like my comedy show, The Ross Bolin Podcast, which you can get whichever wherever you consume, banging the can. If you're watching True Detective Season 4, Night Country, on HBO right now, we are covering that episode by episode with a companion podcast called Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, available wherever you get Banging the Can as well. I host that with another Houstonian, Barrett Dudley, uh, one of my best friends of over 20 years, huge Texans, Rockets, Astros guy as well. Um... 
But tell people about the show. Tell people about what we've got going on here. Subscribe, rate, review, share our social media posts, like, comment, comment below on YouTube. If you're here, if you're here on YouTube and you're not subscribed, hit the button right now. And I appreciate y'all. It's been a fun Texan season. Follow us on social media at Banging the Can on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, or X at Banging the Can. I'm Ross Bolin. You can follow me on X and Instagram at W R B O L E N. This train does not stop. Banging the Can keeps going. Rockets, content, Astros, offseason, Texas, Texans offseason, all coming in the coming weeks. And uh, yeah, I appreciate y'all. Until next time, H Town, hold it down.